another video. Uh, today's a really special video because I'm out camping with my cousin who is a water quality biologist and he studies um, basically the effects of humans on the ecosystem, on fish. He just finished some landmark research on the effects of mercury in fish in the Snake River in Idaho. Uh, and I'd like to take this opportunity to talk to him about some of the stuff he's been doing and maybe if he can give us some tips on how while we're out here loving these wild places, what effect are we having on these places? And what are some things that we can do to mitigate our effects, to, to minimize our effects? Uh, yeah, I'm Nick Gastelacuto, Kelly's cousin. Um, we're here in an extremely wild place. Um, I've studied rivers for pretty much my entire life, everything from endangered species like steelhead and chinook salmon uh, to endangered snails. Uh, now I've more focused on biogeochemistry of rivers. Um, we did a study for the last 10 years and have recently published a lot of journal articles on methylmercury and how it's created, how it moves through the food web, how it gets into the fish that people care about, that people catch and, and eat, um, tribes sustain themselves with sturgeon uh, and, and those are particularly high so we're, we're trying to figure out the story and then figure out ways to uh, reduce methylmercury in the environment. Yeah. Kelly and I are here in an extremely wild place that I love, um, a particularly delicate ecosystem with uh, there's endangered bull trout here, there's in, threatened steelhead which should probably be endangered if the politics were right um, endangered chinook salmon um, i think the human experience of coming to these places to learn to appreciate them is very important i can't remember the philosopher that said it but i said uh, people only understand what they are taught they only love what they understand and they only conserve what they love. And I think the only way people are going to build a love for wild places is to experience it. Um, but with that, and it's particularly in places like this, I've seen a lot more people. And that's awesome in a sense, but it also, these ecosystems had a way of being able to buffer themselves from poor human actions because there was not a lot of people around. But now as people come in and, and experience these places, the collective actions have an effect. Baba Diom, I believe, said, uh, if one tugs at a single thing in nature, he finds it attached to the rest of the universe. And the more I learn about rivers, I've been studying rivers my whole life, and the more I learn about that and the more I understand it, the more that philosophical statement comes to life. Um, it's such a delicate place where even things that people don't see have a extreme effect. You know, in the soil there's microbes, in the water there's macroinvertebrates or bugs, and then you follow that food web and that chain of life all the way up to there's bears in these mountains and there's wolves um, and there's humans top you know top level consumers um, as far as campers coming into these wild places and what you can do to mitigate it I think just the bottom line is have respect just just have respect for the place and the life that is there um, I think a lot of times people just don't have the knowledge to understand that their actions are detrimental to the ecosystem and they're coming out here, you know, living like it's their backyard pool <laughs> and that's okay to a certain extent and I think it's important, but um, you know, when you're in wild places like this, I mean, obviously something that everybody knows about is trash and litter and it's so incredibly important in these delicate ecosystems to, to pack out what you pack in or drive in. Um, erosion can have pretty large effects in this river. There's 
steelhead and salmon that they swim 2,000 miles to come up here to spawn. Um, and if people are driving their four-wheelers or their motorcycles or their trucks on places that are not established, it can create erosion and bring sediment into the river that covers up the eggs and kills all the, the anadromous fish eggs. So what does that mean, like driving through, like if there's not a, like are people driving through the rivers with their four-wheelers? And not even necessarily rivers, but if you, there's so many mountains surrounding us that with the advent of the new ATV vehicles, they, even driving on the mountains, on places where there's not established roads and disrupting the, the vegetation creates more sedimentation because of when it snows and that snow runs off, it brings with it the now loose, loose dirt, loose. Oh, I see. Uh huh. Loose gravel. Uh huh. And let's go back for a second f about trash. I mean, this is, might be an obvious question, but what constitutes trash? Obviously, like wrappers, food wrappers, um, you know, stuff left behind. But what about like I don't know, banana peels or or food waste, or um, or even like going to the bathroom. Uh, how should we look at that stuff? Um, trash is a big question because the stuff you can see is a big deal. Um, just for the scenic beauty of the place and the appreciation. Um, a lot of growing research is starting to look into microplastics mm -hmm. and in places like this where there hasn't been microplastics because it's just above human civilization you know fleeces and things like that get work their way into the food web and start to have physiological detriments to the wildlife um, as far as going to the bathroom that you know human waste in places like this is not such a huge concern because there's just not a lot of people but there are established forest service um, pit toilets and those you know i would use those first obviously if you have a chance even if that means you got to drive a few miles digging a pit and burying it is pretty safe as long as you're away from the river um you know human excrement comes with bacteria and things that are not native to this to this landscape but if you bury it it's it's fine um what about like soaps and um, other chemicals that we might have with us so soaps comes down to the nutrients that's within the soap um so things like phosphate and what you're doing by releasing shampoo or soap into the water is you're providing fertilizer for lack of a better term to the water body and it's such a fine balance in the ecosystem that when you add fertilizer it starts creating different organisms to to be able to outcompete others um, you know on a macro scale like down in urban landscapes where you have all of it you know every everyone lives downstream and when you have entire human populations somewhat unknowingly washing their car soap and everything else from the streets and from the lawns and into the gutters and into the river it, it creates a lot of nutrients that are not uh, native to the environment and that in the ecosystem balance it allows things to outcompete others that didn't before like uh, I think a lot, I, I work a lot with harmful algal blooms and I think one of the reasons, not, I don't think, I know one of the reasons that uh, we're seeing a lot more harmful algal blooms in the United States is A, climate change and increasing temperatures, but the other side of it is increased nutrients. And so what it does is it allows the, the algae and the phytoplankton that we're used to seeing, a lot of them had the ability to fix nitrogen. So to create their own nutrients from atmospheric nitrogen. And now what we're seeing is with all of the nitrates coming into the water bodies, there's other species that are out competing those. Um, and those are the ones that are toxic, like the cyanobacteria, microcystis, 
Anabina, just a lot. I mean, the list is pretty endless, but um, soaps disrupt the balance. So you, you, in delicate ecosystems, especially like this one, like Baba Diom, you know, you, one tugs at a single thing in nature, he finds it attached to everything else, and you disrupt the bottom layer of the food web, and everything else above it is affected. Um, and, and that's reaching all the way up to humans. You know, the, the toxins that the cyanobacteria produce, there's growing bodies of research about their effects on irrigation on crops because people pull the water out of the rivers to irrigate their crops and those toxins are pretty persistent in the environment. All right, so one way that we can really uh, help minimize our impact is by picking up our trash, not putting chemicals in the water. What about organic waste at campsites? Like uh, if you have some fruit peels, say, or some, I don't know, leftover dinner that you've finished, is that all right to like um, kind of leave in a pile in the campfire ring or? Uh... Um, no, I don't think so. I think A, you're disrupting the experience of the next person there. And you know, when you, when you put in the effort and pay the money for the gas to get to a wild place. You certainly don't want to see other people's trash and, and organic waste there. I think if you're responsible enough to put it in the fire and burn it out and burn off the carbon so that all that's left is, is ashes, I don't see a problem with it as long as you're not putting things in there like plastic or tin foil, which comes with a lot of the wrappers that we have. Now, uh -huh. you know, even the paper juice boxes have plastic on the on the sides of the cardboard i think the general rule is you know the leave no trace ethics is is pretty important um especially where in areas like river corridors where that attracts so many people and the collective action can be so huge over time uh -huh. so you've loved these places all your life you've been traveling to these places and you've really seen some changes with the area and, and you've really seen some bad actions by some campers. Uh, so what are some, just from a camping etiquette uh, standpoint, what are some things that people should really, uh, you know, watch out for some really, you know, bad actions that you don't want to be doing out here? Um, yeah, I've grown up and lived in a place pretty rare in that there hasn't been a lot of people until now but now that there's more people one of the big camping etiquettes that people seem to lack is if you're going to a wild place and somebody's camped there you don't need to camp right next to them like there's enough public land here for now at least that you can drive another mile down the road or four miles down the road and maybe that campsite isn't exactly what you wanted but you provide a better experience for everybody if you're if you don't just pull in and <laughs> camp right next to somebody you know campgrounds are different they're established diffuse camping uh yeah it's it's one of my pet peeves is when i especially backpacking or, or when you put a lot of effort in to get away from people for me and that's not always what everybody's after i think people do find comfort in other people but the, etic the etiquette that I would like to see followed is just respect other people's space. And that means acoustic pollution, right? Not everybody comes to the mountains to listen to music, <laughs> not, not every, and especially not your music. Um, that was an endangered bumblebee right there. Oh, really? <laughs> yeah, but I just flicked away. <laughs> um, but yeah, you know, and it requires more effort, and I understand sometimes you, you're tired if you're backpacking or if you're rafting but if somebody's camped in the spot that you want you have to put in the other effort to, and even if you got to go to a campsite that's not as nice uh -huh. you know, or not right next to the river like you were hoping or whatever yeah so when there's not like campsite numbers like if you go to a campsite and there's established sites that's one thing you've got your site and you're fine I guess, so maybe if you, if you are unsure, if you're too close to somebody, you could always go up and ask. That, and that, that is fine. Um, 
yes, if you have the etiquette to go ask and be willing for somebody to say no, almost never has somebody come and asked me, hey man, I'm really tired. I got a car full of kids and we can't find a spot. Is it okay if we camp next to you? And never have I said no. There's people out there that would and that's fine. Uh -huh. um, but yeah, just communication <laughs> and okay. talking to a stranger yeah. it goes a long ways. So kind of respecting not only the place, but uh, other people's experience of the place, right? Yeah. You know, like I said, I have a deep love for these places. I have a deep understanding of these places. And the more people that grow to love and understand wild places, the better off we're going to be. Um, when it comes to policy making, when it comes to management, if the voice of the public is large and larger than than corporations that are looking to exploit the resource for, for monetary gain, I think it's really important. And so you want, if you love these places or if you're just discovering these places and you're finding out how amazing they are, help conserve them by improving other people's experience. You know, if, if somebody comes away from a national forest and they got 50 RVs that camped right next to them and people are blaring music and and ripping chainsaws and and ripping motorcycles around, you know, there's there's definitely places for that. Um, but you don't get to hear the sandhill cranes calling. You don't get to see the osprey diving into the water. You don't you don't get to experience nature enough to come to love how complex it is and how beautiful it is and how special how special it is and how lucky we are to live in a time where it's all still here. Um, these, these mountain streams are so incredibly important to the ecosystem, especially as climate change. It's, it's here, <laughs> it's here, right? The data says that, that trout will likely, salmonids will likely be extinct in the next 20 years. Wow. And that's a that's a big deal. Yeah. You know, and so this stream is warmer than I've ever seen it. It's probably in the realm of like 20, 21 C and should, anadromous fish can really only survive about up to 24. So we're getting close to the threshold of extinction. Wow. I mean, they can survive it by finding cold water refugia from like little creeks coming in. But um, yeah, it's, it's scary. Uh -huh. What are some ways, if somebody wanted to get involved more or donate, what are some ways that maybe people can make a difference? Are there organizations that you recommend or? Um... Um, local rec local NGOs are, are, can be really powerful if they have a big enough membership. Um, What's know. an NGO? A non-governmental organization. Oh, okay. Like, um, you know, I here in Idaho, there's Idaho Rivers United and Idaho Conservation League, and Idaho Wildlife Federation, um, and they all do good work. And I think, you know, recently, I've gotten involved in politics, maybe more than I would have liked. <laughs> um, but I did find that your state representative or your state senator maybe not senator but at least your state representative is willing to listen if you contact them and if you come with facts and you come with logical arguments um it can make a difference i've yet to see the difference here because the conservation is tough to out compete industry and big money but the more people that come together, the more people that organize, the more people that care, the more people that let their voice be heard in, in arenas that it matters, like policy creation and management creation. And, you know, there's all sorts of meetings that there's only four people in, you know, mm. um, it matters. Your voice matters. You just have to put it out there and be, be willing to accept that things move really slow mm -hmm. in U.S. politics. Mm. Yeah. Cool. So like, uh, so getting involved in conservancies, 
conservation groups, that sort of thing can really have an impact then. Yeah, and I mean, money talks. Yeah. Right? <laughs> money talks. I've found that lawyers are needed in a lot of stuff and lawyers are expensive. Um, the, so donations obviously help if it's a cause that you're passionate about. Really big donations, especially. <laughs> but, yeah. You know, the common man like myself, it's not, not a reality. Um, yeah, cool. I want to thank Nick so much for taking the time to teach us so that we can understand and love and conserve these places that we have all come to love so much. If you're interested in reading more about his research, check out the links below. Thanks, Nick, for sharing your love with us and for all of the wonderful work you're doing for our planet.